and greetings, everyone. Firstly, a full and heartfelt acknowledgement of Wadjuk Noongars, whose generosity the people of Southwest Australia enjoy. Let's hope that the new Prime Minister Albanese's first and last words on election night see the full implementation of the Uluru Statement from the Heart in his term of government. So I'm glad that um, Mike mentioned that as well. Gratitude to IPAN for inviting me to share a perspective which will probably be seen as outlandish, Pollyanna-ish, even, never mind. Someone's got to keep stating what I see as the bleeding obvious, that preparing for war is not the way to peace. Backtracking to 1661, when Quakers presented their peace testimony to the newly installed monarch, King Charles II, in which it was declared, we utterly deny all outward wars and strife and fightings with outward weapons for any end or under any pretense whatever. This is our testimony to the whole world. Therefore, we cannot learn war anymore. During a time of political upheaval, Quakers and other dissenters were viewed with suspicion by a very fragile new government after the turbulence of the Cromwell years, during which Quakers, then one of the many new religious groupings, had refused to take up arms for either side. They suffered for their stand then and have mostly adhered to the peace testimony ever since for over 360 years. It's one of the main aspects which drew me to Quakerism 50 years ago. It's based on the belief that there is goodness, even a spark of the divine in every person, which leads to the goal of treating all people everywhere with respect. Most people of faith would be anti-war, and there are lots of representatives of such groups within our IPAN community. But what about anti-militarism? Sadly, as you all know, Australia's history is replete with fighting wars on foreign soils on behalf of other nations, while still ignoring the frontier wars fought on this soil. A high level of courtesy to the military continues unabated, with John Howard responsible for igniting new loyalty in his Anzacary, as I call it, encouraging young Australians to go to Gallipoli to commemorate the pointless deaths of so many young Australian men. What is it with our country that three of the days which most of us recognise each year are so negative? There's Australia Day, better labelled as Invasion or Survival Day, then Anzac Day, when we should be saying not only lest we forget, but never again. Then the Melbourne Cup, where we gamble on the torture of horses being beaten around a racetrack for our enjoyment and profit. Recently, we've had then Minister Defence, um, Defence Minister Dutton beating the drums of war against China, not clever by any yardstick. Early signs from the new government don't look good either, except that there is better recognition of Pacific neighbours as sovereign states whom we must respect. But the commitment to the American alliance, described as dangerous by former Conservative Prime Minister Fraser, as Alison reminded us, is as strong as ever, as is commitment to the new AUKUS, tying us into the stupidest, not silliest, I would say, but stupidest, spends on nuclear submarines with a five and a half billion dollar tag for getting out of the deal with France. Absolutely nothing except bad vibes to show for it. I wonder whether the new government's line by line scrutiny of expenditure to cut costs will extend to the military budget. So why this unquestioning acceptance of huge so-called defense expenditure in this country? Much of that goes to the interoperability requirements of the United States military. For example, the long range F-35 fighter jets, which we do not need to defend our continent. We're very fortunate to have an air sea gap around our shores, which should be a distinct advantage in maintaining security. But it's mostly overlooked as we rush to enmesh our forces with those of our so-called great friend and ally. It's getting worse by the day. From 2011, when President Obama decided upon the US pivot to Asia and informed the then Prime Minister Gillard 
that a rotation of US Marines would visit Darwin annually. She seemed pleased rather than questioning. Of course, the number and seeming uh, permanence of US troops on Australian soil has increased and is unwittingly accepted by most Australians. The upgrading of Pine Gap facilities, tying Australia further and further into the war fighting capacity of the United States is almost unnoticed by the wider public. Unfortunately, we have a revolving door syndrome between the military, government advisors, and former government ministers when it comes to military matters. This is the state capture syndrome, so clearly enunciated by the Australian Democracy Network in their recent report, Confronting State Capture, in which the arms industry is one of their two detailed case studies. During Malcolm Turnbull's prime ministership, it was declared that Australia was aiming to be one of the top 10 arms manufacturers in the world, as though that was desirable. The Swedish International Peace Research Institute, SIPRI, annual statement of military expenditure for 2021, had Australia ranked 12th in the world on military expenditure. Why on earth? Increasingly, remote controlled weapons of war take a huge toll on human lives and on the environment. Of grave concern is the huge amount of embedded energy in the weapons, whether they're used or not. And the fact that the military forces of the world are collectively the biggest users of fossil fuels by a long way, a fact which is omitted from a nation's inventories of greenhouse emissions. Manufacturers and traders in arms don't care to whom they sell their wares, and in some instances may even be fanning the flames of war to ensure good returns for themselves and their shareholders. Part of the problem is the politics of fear, creating an enemy when none exists. I reckon we're addicted to militarism, if not to war itself. It's a kind of national psychic numbing to the reality of our circumstances referred to by Rod Bauer in the latest edition of the Saturday paper as moral injury. For those of us alert to the conundrum of communities blind, blind acceptance of militarism, that, that we feel a betrayal by leadership malpractice over generations. Australia should be in good relationship with all its neighbors and trading partners. That doesn't mean that we have to agree with everything another country does, and we used to have a good reputation for speaking up and acting upon human rights issues. Not anymore. Our treatment of asylum seekers has been appalling. Recent arrivals are just the beginning of future onslaughts as people have to flee from the ravages of the climate crisis. We should have been practicing sharing and generosity as a rich country, but instead we've resorted to torture and fear mongering. Also, the ongoing disparity between living standards of the oldest living culture in the world and all the boat people, that's us, who've come to these shores since 1788, hardly gives us a clean slate in criticizing others. Imagine for a moment if our defense budget was truly defensive only, cut to allow for patrol boats and patrol aircraft around our shores, but not buying submarines, especially nuclear, which would, if ever becoming a reality, probably be obsolete before they hit the water. One commentator recently wrote that Dutt was like a kid in a candy shop going to the arms traders conventions. I'll have one of those and a couple of those. Oh yes, that too. Promoting militarism by such bizarre events and by the almost incessant rehearsals for war, stupidly called war games, there's nothing gamey about them, which cost bucket loads of money, must be challenged. Consider even half of the military budget um, expenditure going towards what our country really needs. Aged care, child care, disability care, the increase in wages, which the business sector says we can't afford whilst raking in huge profits. Education, including deprivatization of universities so that they become once again places of learning rather than businesses, upgrading our manufacturing sector so that when the next pandemic hits, we're not so dependent on international supply lines. 
and environmental management so that instead of slashing the endangered species list, which was one of the last tasks Susan Lay undertook before the election, and of course, attention to the climate crisis, ensuring that transition to renewable energy doesn't result in job losses for those currently working in the fossil fuel sector. I had naively thought that the pandemic might usher in a kinder community globally, that people would see how interconnected we all are, no matter where is home on this precious little planet. But inspiring Indian writer Arundhati Roy reminds us that the globe is like a huge chess set with players ready for their next moves and whoever is first in best dressed after an upheaval wins. Multinational corporations were all ready to pounce on any opportunity offered by the discombobulation of the pandemic. But the progressives around the planet were a tad slow off the mark, which is understandable considering the international conglomerates extensive networking and expertise in maintaining the status quo for their own benefit. However, there are pockets of hope and inspiration if we care to look for them. So despite the fact that recognizable peace movements have existed for over a hundred years, like the International Peace Bureau founded in 1891 and the Women's International League for Peace and Freedom founded in 1915 in the middle of the First World War. And although some would say such citizen movements have been ignored, we must acknowledge that there is a huge body of work and effort which has produced a raft of possibilities for the future. The League of Nations and its successor, the United Nations, formed with the very best of intentions, have often been stymied by vested interests. Consider the UN 17 Sustainable Development Goals, all of which could be met with ease if only the global community cut its addiction to militarism. For generations, ordinary citizens have been calling for an end to war, but I contend that we must also call for an end to militarism in all its insidious forms, with its tentacles reaching into so many unexpected places. It is the mindset of militarism which needs to change. We have seen the power of nonviolent revolutions in our time, but too often the benefits are short-lived. Who would have thought that a Marcos Duterte regime would be reinstalled in the Philippines? And the Arab Spring uprisings have not evenly distributed better outcomes for the populaces which had faced repression for so long. But people in the streets generally know what's right and what's wrong, and sometimes to their great cost, they challenge the authorities on a massive scale in committing wholesale civil disobedience. Of course there will be casualties, but probably not nearly as many had an angered citizenry taken up arms against their oppressors. So despite its risks and shortcomings, how can we promote the idea of a non-violent way to solve disputes from the personal to the international levels? It's worth looking at some of the main proponents from the 20th century, like Mohandas Gandhi and Martin Luther King, practitioners of non-violence, and writers like Gwyn Dyer, Canadian historian, who recently delivered a TED talk on the matter, and Ackerman and Duval's A Force More Powerful, A Century of Non-Violent Conflict. Uh, published in 2000. And of course, there is a myriad of international organizations devoted to ending the nuclear arms race and to demilitarization in general. So the ideas are there, but promoting them to the general population so that they are taken seriously by governments is quite another matter. But IPAN is doing a good job thus far, especially with its um, amazing uh, inquiry which will be revealed shortly. Back in the 80s, I was part of various active peace groups keen to challenge the government of Bob Hawke with Kim Beasley called Bomber because he was very excited by military hardware as defense minister. He wrote a rejoinder for the 1990 book, The New Australian Militarism, co-edited by Graham Cheeseman and Sinjin Kettle in which various authors wrote chapters outlining a possible new defense strategy for Australia. There were proponents of either new armed neutrality or social defense, like Brian Martin, whose 1984 book, Uprooting War, still rings true. It seems that the more things change, the more they stay the same. 
Armed neutrality would be a huge shift for any Australian government to contemplate and an even bigger challenge to mainstream mindsets, which uh, would be the idea of social defence. It is possible for Australia to disagree with the US and to remain in good relationship. The same should be true of China, everybody's biggest trading partner. What is required is an independent foreign policy so that we can take our modest place on the world stage without being subservient to any nation. Social defence requires an engaged citizenry trained in non-violent resistance to our own government if necessary, and certainly to any outside aggressor, although we have no natural enemies. It remains to be seen whether the new Labour government will stick to its word in supporting the treaty to prohibit nuclear weapons. We should follow the lead of Aotearoa in establishing a ministry for peace and disarmament, which would show our Asian and Pacific neighbours that we mean well and that we're not merely a lackey of the United States. We once had an ambassador for disarmament back in the 80s and some good initiatives were rolled out, like the strong support for the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty and the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty and the internationally acclaimed Canberra Commission which made some excellent recommendations regarding disarmament, most of which have not been implemented. In these days of cyber warfare, technology can be used for good or evil as we know. So perhaps the power of social media could be harnessed to expound the ideas of massive non-cooperation, which can bring a government or oppressive force to its knees. But of course, a preferred option is to build good relationships with all neighbors based on mutual respect and justice. Soon, Australia will engage again in the Republic debate. Perhaps we could extend the options to a dual cutting of ties with the US as well, voting for independence both ways, so we could truly claim our sovereignty, which would only be possible if we had already embraced the Uluru Statement from the heart. As John Lander already quoted, I was going to finish with this too, our Pacific, Pacific neighbours say, friend to all, enemy to none.